Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, colleagues, thank you for inviting me. I think that uh, those questions are interesting, but I thought that there was a more provocative question that was phrased originally, uh, and that was uh, following what President Zuma said, is that the ANC will be ruling uh, until, until Jesus uh, comes. And, and, and that, I thought, was an interesting phrasing of the question, because what it, I think, suggests is when President Zuma makes a statement like that, it suggests that there is, at the heart of the ANC, a level of complacency. And what I was particularly uh, attracted to in these results was the fact that these results, I think, send a very strong message uh, to both the ANC and to the DA that they, can, that they shouldn't be complacent. That actually these results uh, are quite powerful and suggest and send significant messages out to suggest that South Africa is going to be a society that's likely to undergo some fundamental changes over the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years. And the first quite striking thing is that, is despite the fact that people might say that the ANC has done well, it's worth bearing in mind that the Zuma administration has now lost votes in two elections. In the first, from about 70% to about 66, and the second from 66 to about 62. And, and, and that's something that should, is sending ripple effects into the party. The second is that if you go away from the national results, there are even more worrying uh, uh, shifts happening at provincial level. Uh, so Gauteng's dropped to the 10%, and the EFF's uh, vote of 10, at least 10% in Gauteng. The fact that the ANC marginally won in a number of the big urban metropoles, Nelson Mandela at fell below 50%, and in uh, Kulilene, Tswane, and, and in Johannesburg, just slightly above that. These are powerful signals to the ANC that you should be thinking very hard about what these elections mean for you. Because if you seriously want to be a party of modernity, and the ANC often describes itself as a nationalist party of modernity, then these results suggest that you're in trouble. Because if you lose the middle classes and you uh, lose the urban metropoles, you're exactly in the place where Zanu PF was. And that's something that you want to start thinking through very, very seriously. The second is that um, the strong showing of the EFF, it seems to me, sends a very powerful message that the real gap in the electorate is to the left of the ANC, not to the right. And that if you look at the A and the DA's results, if you listen to Helen Ziller, she will say to you that we've jumped quite consistently every election, and she's right. But in 2009, it jumped to 16% from 12, and then in 2014, uh, it jumped to 20, uh, 22%. Uh, but uh, it is interesting that compared to the local government elections, which was 24%, uh, it didn't jump as much. Uh, it is interesting that it's got to ask why in places like Marikana and in other places where people get turned off the ANC in such dramatic ways, but they refuse to vote for the DA and what does that mean for the DA's politics and what does it stand for. And in part, if the electorate is onto the left of the a a a ANC, the real gap, the real challenge it has is how is it going to deal and how can it project itself uh, to appeal to that lot. And, and, and the one thing that's quite striking is that even in its imagery, the DA hasn't been capable of being able to do this. So what is striking is that in the midst of a a massacre in Marikana. In any other country in the world, the opposition would have been there, the official and opposition would have been there the next day. The ANC, the DA wasn't anywhere to be seen in Marikana. It was Julius Malema and one or two others who went to Marikana, but not, not the DA. And what does it sell about them and how that was read by people? So I do think that there's powerful signals going out. I want to quickly look at those questions. What does this mean for the quality of democracy and what does it mean for identity politics? You know, for me, it does, does the fact that there's a large degree of correlation uh, impact on people, uh, a, a large degree of correlation between race and the way people vote? Of course there is. It's quite clear. The one thing, however, is I think you need to make an assumption uh, 
do not make to that this is a kind of irrational vote. That even given the overlaps between class and race and other identities in South Africa, I think there could be very, very rational reasons for why you would vote in a particular way. And, and, and this is not simply a vote simply defined by irrationality or simply by the fact that the DA has a white leader. It is informed by much more complex considerations, part of which is do you represent our interests and do we feel that you can kind of articulate our interests in this historical epoch? And I do think that there's a really interesting conversation to be had about some of these issues. On the issue of the Zuma presidency, I'm not so sure that they're going to be sanguine. I think the mere fact that they chose David Makura to become premier in Gauteng suggests that there's some serious ripple effects happening and that even at the heart of Lutuli House, there's a, there's a question mark about what does the Gauteng results mean for us and what does it say about whether we're doing enough. I'm not so sure, however, that it's going to address the kind of social democratic vision that we want to talk about. Because the one thing that it seems to me is you're still getting complex signals out of the ANC. And the thing that frightens me about the National Development Plan, I think that there's a lot of positive things in this plan. But I think it ducks the fundamental question at the heart of the economy. And that is how to address inequality. And the National Development Plan's uh, plan about dealing with inequality is by going after poverty. And the hope is that if you go after poverty, somehow you'll miraculously deal with inequality. And I think that the real question is you can actually address poverty, as has happened in China and in India and in other places, without addressing inequality, in fact, of aggravating inequality. And part of that uh, has demonstrated itself in South Africa over the last 20 years. And the real dilemma we need to deal with is how do you deal with, by dealing with poverty, getting growth going, people on the top end grow faster than the guys at the bottom end because they have assets, stocks, bonds. And that question uh, is, is something that has been ducked. And I want to end with a look at the left. I do think that the interesting thing about the EFF is it shows that the party, that there is a gap in the, on the left of the ANC. But I don't think that the EFF on its own represents that. And so part of the vote for the EFF, I think, is a protest vote. If you want to go in, into that, uh, po uh, if you want to go into that electoral uh, election uh, poll, and you want to then look at who to vote for, and you want to send a message to the ANC, one of the ways you do so is to vote for the prodigal son of the ANC, which is the EFF, because that will irritate Jacob Zuma far more than had you voted for for Helen Zilla, and that was the logic for a fair degree of people who voted for the EFF. The thing that it sends to me is that if you had a more coherent party to the left of, 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 of the ANC, one coming out of the trade union movement, one that has legitimacy, which is something that NUMSA, NUMSA's evolution of a party could have, one that has no organizational infrastructure because it's based in the trade union movement, one that has access to money, it could pro perform fairly well. The challenge for that party, however, is it runs the risk of narrowly appealing to the working class. And it runs the risk of constructing the alternatives in such extreme ways that sometimes I see in the language, not in the documentation, but in the language of some of the personalities that you could actually mitigate the potential you have. The great conversation that often happens on the, when you, people talk about the left is they look at the PT. The real lesson of the PT is it might be predicated on the labor movement, but as a party, it appealed to a much wider generation of people. It, it appealed to a much wider generation of people than simply the organized working class. And that the trick of something coming out of Kosato has to be that it can't simply be appealing to the organized workers. It must be constructed in a language and in a policy agenda and in an imagery that can appeal to a wider layer than simply the organized workers. The organized workers can be an important component of that alliance, but it must appeal to the lower middle classes, to the irate liberal intellectuals in the upper middle classes, the unemployed, all of those kinds of categories, very much as the way the PT did. And I wonder whether there is that kind of imagination 
and political courage in parts of, 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 of the union movement who are talking about this. So I have that, for me, is the big, big uh, question as we move forward. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Adam.